Hi. <laughs> my name's Tristan. That was already said, but my name is still Tristan. Uh, I'm the worship director here at Community Grace. I have been for the last almost three years. I love my job. I love this church. I love the people at this church. Um, I, I know a lot of you. I don't know all of you, and I try to catch people on Sundays. I don't always get around to everybody. If we haven't met yet, I would love to meet you. Find me. I'll try to find you. But for the sake of this morning, I, I like doing this with larger groups where I don't know everybody. For the sake of this morning, just so that we know each other, so that you know each other, could you, like, tell me your name? Like, maybe on, like, the count of three, you could just say your name out loud. Like, let's try that. One, two, three. Okay, I'm going to do my best to remember. Thank you. <laughs> my name's Tristan. Again, I'm a, I'm a worship director here. I, I've been on staff for almost three years, but I've been a part of this church for, for nine. I started attending here when I was a student at Grace College. I got a degree in biblical studies and youth ministry uh, with the intention of not leading worship. But um, God is sovereign. His plans are better than mine, and I'm really grateful and thrilled for, for the direction that he's taken my life. Um, I, uh, I graduated from Grace, and I ended up not working directly in, in ministry right away. I ended up working in the marketplace for a few years. I worked for a company called Slingshot. Stephanie Rager uh, works at Slingshot. She's a VP at Slingshot. So I managed, I did some campus store stuff at some different Christian colleges. I managed the Grace campus store for a year, sold a lot of stuff that says Grace on it. Um, and then for a year, I taught music lessons. I taught a lot of four-year-olds how to play ukulele. I tried to teach a lot of four-year-olds how to play ukulele. Um, and then uh, during that whole time, I really had a desire to be in ministry. God had clarified my calling away from youth ministry into worship ministry. And so, I, and I felt like I was supposed to be in Warsaw. So for the job to finally open up, the calling to open up, for me to get to be at Community Grace, at my church, that I love, with the people that I love, getting to do the thing that I love, that I feel God has called me to do, was, and I'm not exaggerating. It was like literally a dream. Um, and three years into it, it's still like the best. I love what I get to do. So thank you. Thanks for being such a wonderful church and a wonderful part of my, fam uh, a part of my story, a wonderful family to me. Um, yeah, another thing that has already been mentioned is I've known Sean Mason a long time. Uh, he and I grew up in the same hometown. We, went to the, we had the same home church. Um, we've worked together a long time. You ever know those people who are like, like just really intense? about certain things. I'm not talking about Sean. <laughs> how, how dare you for thinking I was talking about Sean? No, I'd like to, actually, I'd like to introduce you to a different person from my childhood. Uh, I, I'd like to invite you into one of my earliest formative childhood traditions and memories uh, with, with, with someone who was very, very intense about a specific thing, one of the earliest formative childhood traditions and memories that I have was every year around Christmas time, my extended family would get together for Christmas through New Year's, so we'd spend the year, we'd spend the week um, together. And, uh, and I've got family in Texas, and I've got family in Colorado, and sometimes we'd travel there, but most of the time they'd come here for Christmas, and the extended family would do Christmas together. And one of my earliest formative childhood traditions and memories was on New Year's Eve, all the cousins would get together for a wonderful game into the new year of Monopoly. And the statistics, the statistics say that there's no board game across the span of human history that's caused as much family trouble as Monopoly. But this is what we did every New Year's Eve. We'd play up through midnight uh, a game of Monopoly. And here's my strategy in Monopoly. I, and I'm like 10. Um, I knew that the blue properties were good. So here's my strategy. I would buy my park place, buy my boardwalk, slap some hotels on that, charge people when they landed on them, bankrupt them, and then win the game. That was my strategy. And that made sense to me. Uh, my cousin Aaron, he's like a year older than me, um, just thought about this thing a little differently. He was really intense about the game of Monopoly. So I'd be keeping my eyes on the blue properties because I knew the blue properties were good. I knew I needed to buy the blue properties, slap some hotels on them, charge people when they landed on them, bankrupt them so I could win the game. But my cousin Aaron would keep his eyes on us. And he's like, what's, what's cousin Tristan buying? What's Anson buying? He would take, and he would take notes. He was real methodical about it. And then uh, lo and behold, I land on Boardwalk. And I pull out my orange $500 Monopoly bill 
And, uh, and I'm getting ready to lay it down so that I can buy a boardwalk because I need boardwalk. I need the blue property so I can slap some hotels on them when people land on them so I can charge them and bankrupt them so I can win the game. But Aaron leans back and he goes, huh, as I'm, as I'm holding my $500 bill, he goes, huh, are you sure about that? No, and I am sure about it because this is my strategy. You need to buy the blue properties and slap some hotels on them and charge people when they land on them and then bankrupt them so you can win the game. But Aaron really knew the game, and I knew that Aaron knew the game. And so now I'm like, I know that Aaron's really intense about Monopoly. What does he know that I don't know? But he knows that that actually is the best decision for me to buy the blue properties and slap the hotels on them and (laughs) charge people so that I bankrupt them and I win the game. But he's inserted this thought in my mind that maybe he knows something that I don't know. But he even knows that it's the best strategy. He's just trying to get me to doubt it. Nevertheless, I prevail, and I lay down my orange $500 Monopoly bill, and uh, I buy my boardwalk because I already had Park Place, so I want the Monopoly, and, I, and there, I have my Monopoly. And then he goes, okay, here's $1,000 and another property for your boardwalk. And now I'm like, oh, what do I do? I could double my investment right here and then get another property on top of it. But he knows that it's actually better for me to not have the monopoly so that that gives him a better chance. What I said was one of my earliest formative childhood traditions and memories was playing a game of monopoly with my cousins into the New Year's. I'm gonna revise that. One of my earliest formative childhood memories was getting whooped in a game of monopoly with the rest of my cousins by Aaron. (laughs) Because Aaron was really intense about the game of monopoly. Uh, and we all have things that we're intense about, and that's kind of cool. We like ha- everyone has things that they that they really dive deep on, and they get to know. And I think that's admirable, and I appreciate that. And for me, a couple things that right now I'm, I'm in this season, I'm kind of like intense about. I, I'm getting really into like coffee, and I've whatever. I've always appreciated coffee, but like I've, I'm reading this book right now about how to make really good coffee at home, and so I'm learning like about the coffee bean and like what happens when you grind it at different sizes, and like what happens when the water hits it and what it pulls up. I, this isn't a coffee conference, but it's cool. I'm like really into it. Uh, nutrition is something that I care about, I think is important, whatever. We don't, don't fight me on that. Um, some people here are really intense about sports, uh, just last night, I went to a, a baseball game. We watched the Fort Wayne Tin Caps play the Lansing Lugnuts. Aren't minor league baseball team names so funny? Like, um, some people are really into sports, and maybe that's because you're an athlete, and you've just taken the time to really get to know your craft. You like know your sport. You've taken the time to master like the techniques and know the strategies and know the physicality of it. And you know what? Good for you. I think that's awesome. Um, some of you are into sports, and you not because you play, but you're just a really big fan, right? Like you know the statistics, and you know the, know the players, and you know the history and the teams, and and like cool, that's cool. Some of us are really into like culture, like understanding the times and what's going on in our culture and history. Some of us are really into like politics and understanding what's going on there, and I think that's good and positive. And we tend to look at people's intensity about things with with a sense of admiration or maybe appreciation, just when we come to recognize and understand, oh wow, they take this thing really serious. Uh, But I have noticed that sometimes we feel weird about people's intensity in their Christianity. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's like, it's like, um, like when people get really serious or intense about following Jesus, we're like, whoa, man, that's weird. <laughs> uh, a couple examples. Um, so, so maybe like, maybe like you know somebody who like will, will choose not to like watch a specific show or movie. Like, like maybe you have a friend. It's like, I, I, I'm just choosing not to watch Marvel movies or whatever. And that's just personal. It's just I, I'm trying to be really discerning about what I'm taking in. And then it's like, whoa, man, what's wrong with you? Like, you don't have to be so intense about things. Or, or maybe it's like a, a specific activity or a game. It's like, I, I, it's not, we're not talking about sin here. Sin is a different thing, but it's just like on a personal level, it's like, oh, I don't know that I want to partake in that. I don't know what, that I want to participate in that. And we're like, why are you being such a stick in the mud? What's wrong with you, weirdo? Or maybe it's not abstinence of a thing. It's like we say, we, someone comes to us and they're like, I'm really struggling. I'm dealing with this issue. And they confide in us and they open up and we say, okay, I'm going to pray for you because we feel weird about saying, let me pray for you right now. <laughs> or, uh, or sharing the gospel when we're out in public and we have opportunities. Like, this is a real thing. The reason we don't do it is because we feel weird about it. Why? Or maybe we're in church and 
and the worship band is playing, and, and you don't sing loudly. No, I'll leave that one alone. Um, but sometimes I think we get weird about Christian intensity. However, what I'd like to suggest this morning is that intense Christianity is just Christianity. Intense Christianity is not like a level up. It's not for the professionals and the pastors and the missionaries and the weirdos. Uh, Intense Christianity is just what this thing was meant to be. It's just Christianity. It's how it was designed. Let's, uh, Let's play a little catch up. Let's catch up on what's going on in the book of Acts. So we're right in the middle of Acts chapter 14 right now, kind of on the tail end. Uh, Acts chapter 13 and 14. Oh, and if you need notes, Chris will come forward. And uh, if you didn't grab a bulletin, if you don't have notes, that would probably be good for you to have. So you can just raise your hand and he'll, he'll make sure you get those. In the middle of Acts chapter 14, in the middle of Paul's first missionary journey. Now here's what's important to know about Paul. He was a zealous guy. He was a very eager guy. And we know that because we see Paul's life play out in the New Testament. Uh, We know that he was excited, and we've noted, this has been really interesting, that Paul has this, like, radical conversion. He, like, comes to know the Lord in a radical, exciting way. And then we have about 10 years where we don't hear anything from Paul. But I have to imagine he got converted. Excuse me. He was converted and, uh, and very excited. Like I, like, I get this picture of him maybe sitting at a table with, like, Peter and James, and he's like, all right, put me in, coach. Put me in. I'm ready. Let's go. But we have 10 years of waiting between when he's converted and Acts chapter 13, where the church lays hands on him and Barnabas and John Mark and sends them out. And I have to imagine that Paul in this moment is like, yes! finally! You know what I mean? He's an eager and zealous guy, and this is what he's been waiting for since he's consecrated and given his life over to the cause of Christ. So they go, and they do it, and we see Paul, tra- Paul and Barnabas, them traveling, and, uh, and, and we see that they have lots of triumphs, like lots of amazing things happen, but also lots of challenges. Like I would imagine his zeal and his excitement is tempered a little bit when he's met with, uh, with the rejection and physical harm, and, and that leads us up to, they get to this place called Lystra, which is where we were last week, right, and Paul does this thing where he heals a man, and they think, they start to worship him, because they think he's a Greek god, they worship him and Barnabas, and they're like, no, 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 don't worship us, and then we get to verse 19, so 19 says, uh, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. Pause. Those are two places where Paul had already been, and things did not go well in Antioch and Iconium in the sense that they were chased out of those towns. They were rejected and really driven away from. So these people who show up are professional Paul and Barnabas haters. This is like they were there to stir people up. And it says, and they persuaded the crowds. So the Jews, the Paul and Barnabas haters, they show up and they like, they hop up the crowds. This crowd that like are trying to worship Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas, they hype them up, they they rile them up for what? To stone Paul. <laughs> they they stoned him and they dragged him out of the city, supposing he was dead. So not only did they did they stone him with the intent to kill, um, but they stoned him really with an understanding, a presumption that they finished the job. They thought he was dead. And then it says, but when the disciples gathered about him, Paul, he rose up, re-entered the city, brave man to go back to where he just was. But then on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. Go ahead and take a look at this map. I think we looked at this last week, but this is just helpful, maybe context for... For, for what we're talking about. Iconium, that's, that's where Paul, one of the first places Paul went where they drove them out, Paul and Barnabas, they drove them to Lystra. Lystra is where they worshiped him and then stoned him. And then it says on the next day after spending the night in Lystra, they headed to Derby. So that's where we're at. That's what we're talking about. That's the context. We're caught up. Uh, there's a few things that I think we can draw out from this passage. Um, the first one being starting in verse 21, this idea of intense Christianity, which we've clarified, that's just Christianity. But intense Christianity includes troubles. Intense Christianity includes troubles. And here's what it says. Check this out. Verse 21. 
when they had preached the gospel to that city, we're talking about Derby. they're in Derby. when they had preached the gospel in Derby and had made many disciples, praise God, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And there's a few things that happen here that I think are worth noting. First off, they go to Derby, and they see people come to know the name of Jesus Christ. They see people repent and turn to Jesus. Praise God. And then it says they do three things. Um, they, they, they start this kind of backwards tour of all the places that they went. They revisit the converts in those cities, and they do three things. Uh, they strengthen the souls of the disciples. Cool. They encourage them to remain faithful, to continue in the faith. And they tell them that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. The picture there is like, imagine you're on a road and the destination is the kingdom of God. And good news, if you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, that's you. You're on this road and the end destination is the kingdom of God. But it says to get there, you must go through many tribulations. To walk into the kingdom of God, you must go through the door of trouble. On the way to the kingdom of God, you must enter through many tribulations. Now for Paul, he has several recent tribulations and troubles fresh on his mind. He's got the confrontation with Elemis on Cyprus. Remember that? That was a few weeks ago. Um, the departing of John Mark, we talked about this. We don't know why John Mark left, but we know that he was commissioned with them with the intention of finishing this missionary journey with them, and he didn't. Uh, so I would imagine that there was probably some, some, um, some hurt, or uh, this was a friend and a partner in ministry who was no longer there for the rest of the journey. Uh, he has uh, being driven out of the cities of Antioch and Iconium, rejection, and then uh, the temptation to receive the adoration of these people. They were worshiping him because they thought he was a Greek god. And then lastly, of course, as, he's, as Paul is telling the believers that you must encounter troubles, he's telling them with physical scars on his body from where the rocks hit him. There's four kinds of troubles that I think, as, as we say, intense Christianity includes, necessitates, requires troubles. There's four specific types that I think Paul would have had fresh in his mind as he's telling the believers this. The first one is social trouble. Intense Christianity would include social trouble. And for Paul, this played out in the rejection of people um, in Antioch and Iconium, like, he showed up, and socially, they rejected his message and chased him out of town. But also, I wonder, too, if in the relationship dynamics between he and Barnabas and John Mark, uh, if, if there was some, some hurt, some social hurt from the friend walking away from the mission that he intended to complete with them. I think intense Christianity includes, requires, necessitates social trouble. And for those of us, some of the ways that plays out is, you know, relationships with others, maybe relationships at work. We stand, uh, we stand as people who claim the gospel of Jesus Christ in a culture that rejects it. And so for us to stand in social settings claiming and clinging to something that the world rejects we will face and encounter times where we have to sacrifice social status, be it at work, at school, in our friendships. Uh, I've, I've had conversations. I've been in youth ministry long enough that I've had actual conversations with students who have met Jesus Christ and asked the question, what do I tell my family because they're afraid they're going to lose relationships with their parents when they tell their parents they love Jesus now? Like, this is a real thing. Significant others, we've, I've had plenty of conversations where I've had to say, I don't know that this relationship honors God. Uh, the, but that's a social, these are social sacrifices or social troubles that we encounter because we bear the name of Jesus Christ. Additionally, I think emotional trouble. I think intense Christianity includes emotional trouble. Now again, 
If you bear the name of Jesus Christ, then you have an enemy. And there is no one else on earth that he wants to destroy more than you. Why is that important? Because I think that, I think that a lot of the things that we would describe as emotional troubles in our lives as Christians and believers are actually just the product of Satan lying to us and trying to get us to believe things about ourselves that aren't true. You don't have to hate yourself. God loves you. You're not a sum of all of your mistakes. You're not a failure. Uh, but these are real thoughts that we have in our real actual heads because we have a real enemy who wants us to be emotionally distressed about things that we know that aren't true. We know they're not true because the word of God says otherwise. But I believe intense Christianity requires, includes emotional troubles. And then third, I think it includes sin trouble. And if you've been a Christian for longer than five minutes, you know that this is true. <laughs> From now until you meet Jesus Christ face to face, you will continue to wrestle with sin. It's a guarantee. You will need to wrestle with the reality of sin and temptation in your life. For Paul, I think that he had to do this when he was tempted to receive the praise of the people in Lystra. And the reason I believe that is because this was fresh off of him coming from Iconium and Antioch where they flat out rejected him. He was chased into the town where they praised him. And he didn't receive it, but I have to believe that fresh off of that kind of rejection, he was tempted to receive the welcome praise of the people there. He didn't. He wrestled with the sin. From now until we meet Jesus face to face, we will wrestle with sin as well. For a lot of us, pornography, that's a big one. Anger. Man, I, I just know, I know so many people who are compulsive. They're like compulsively angry. They don't want to be angry, but then they get angry, and then they're angry about, at themselves for the fact that they got angry, and I don't want to make light of that. That's a, that's a real thing that a lot of people struggle with. That's a wrestling. Pride. Pride is rooted so deep in so many of us that we're like prideful about things that we don't even realize. That's a sin struggle, a trouble, a wrestling that we have. Intense Christianity, I, I know, in certain includes sin troubles. But fourth, I think Paul had this in mind. It includes physical trouble. And again, for Paul, this was pretty obvious. He's encouraging the believers in this way with physical scars on his physical body of where physical rocks were dug into his skin. I don't know that I necessarily believe that in our lifetimes we'll have to face being killed for Jesus Christ, but you know what? I don't want to be flippant about it. I want to be prepared in case if I ever have the choice between rejecting Jesus Christ and having stones dug into my body to the point of death, that I would choose the rocks. I don't, I don't want to be flippant about that. In reality, though, most of us will face physical trouble because of the reality that we live in a fallen physical realm, a fallen physical world uh, that is not what it's meant to be. Romans 8 says that all of creation groans as a result of the fact that it is, a, that it is fallen from how it was intended to be. Uh, most of us will face physical troubles uh, through sickness. Man, and there's some in this room right now that are facing that. We just know things, it's not how it was supposed to be. Or we'll face a physical trouble through the loss of loved ones. There's some people in this room who have been following Jesus for 60 plus years. Have you seen trouble? Yeah, of course. It would not be hard to find many examples of that. There's people in this room who have been following Jesus more than twice the amount of time that I've been breathing, and yet I've seen troubles. Jesus said this would happen. In John chapter 16, he says, I've said these things to you so that you may have peace. 
in this world you will have trouble or tribulation. Does God keep his promises? Yeah, he's good on his word. He, prom he, he said it. He said it was going to happen. It's a guarantee. In this world you will see trouble. And then he says, but take heart because I've overcome the world. And this world is not it. We have eternity to look forward to where it'll be perfect and it'll be good for the rest of all of existence. And Peter, I love how Peter thinks about this. The book of 1 Peter is this glorious, this rich text about suffering and tribulation and, and trouble. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, he talks specifically about the idea of suffering when you don't deserve it. So he says, if you suffer and you deserve it, well, then you've brought the suffering upon yourself. But you are blessed if you suffer when you don't deserve it. Why? Because then you share in the sufferings of Christ. Jesus suffered and didn't deserve it. And it's a blessing to you when you suffer when you don't actually deserve it. I want to honor those who are here who have faithfully followed Christ through many seasons of trouble. And there are several. You're setting an example for me. Um, you're setting an example for, for my future children. And because generations learn based on what's passed down to them, my future grandchildren will benefit from your faithfulness. So thank you. Thank you for enduring. Intense Christianity, uh, it includes troubles. But additionally, I think from this text you see, intense Christianity includes, it necessitates, it requires multiplication. Intense Christianity includes multiplication. Check this out, verse 23. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. Uh, look, at, look again at this map. Check this out. This just gives some context for what we're talking about. So Iconium and Antioch near Pisidia, um, those were the regions where they were. Uh, that's, those are the regions where they started. And then you see in these verses they're heading south. They stop in Perga and they're headed toward Italia because they're going to hop on a boat on the coast there to head back to Syrian Antioch, which is different than Pisidian Antioch. That's important. Uh, Syrian Antioch, where they're taking the boat to, is where the early church was kind of headquartered. So they're heading south to, to get to Italia so they can jump on a boat and head home. That's, that's what's going on here. What I want to point out here in these verses, though, is how these guys were just multiplying themselves everywhere that they went. They preached the word in Perga. They appointed elders and leaders in churches where they couldn't stay. These guys were like, they were intense about multiplication. They didn't just go, they didn't just stop in Perga on the way to the boat. They preached the word. They didn't just head to the airport. They went to the airports, and they were, they were Christians about it. They didn't just grab lunch. They grabbed lunch, and, they, and they, uh, they looked to multiply themselves while they were having lunch. And these guys were intense about multiplying themselves everywhere that they went. If, uh, if you are doing anything, if you're doing anything anywhere, in the name of Jesus Christ, and Colossians 3 tells us that we should be doing everything everywhere in the name of Jesus Christ, then you need to be doing it multiplying yourself. You need to be discipling other people to be uh, doing what you are doing in the name of Jesus Christ as well. The ways that this uh, plays out, if you are volunteering anywhere in, in, the, in ministry at this church, then consider what, what would it look like for me to bring someone along and disciple them to do what I'm doing? If you are in a, in a work environment where there are people who don't know Jesus Christ, then consider what it would, what it would take for you to multiply, multiply the influence of the gospel of Jesus Christ in your workplace so that there are more people who bear the name of Jesus Christ. If you have a family, for goodness sake, disciple your children on how to spend time with the Lord. Disciple your siblings on how to spend time with the Lord. Multiply yourself in these ways. This is important. Uh, and this is the example that Paul and Barnabas set. Um, 
One, one small thing that I'd like to point out about the, this set, this chunk of verses, and you may be wondering this. This is Paul's first missionary journey, yes? And so these cities that we've seen where they've gone, uh, this is the first time that they've, they've heard the gospel, and so many of these Christians are a few weeks old. How is it that there are Christians there that are mature enough to be appointed elders? And that is a good question. Here are a couple thoughts. Uh, number one, consider what God is doing in this period of human history. 2,000 years ago, he is building the first generation of his church, and the church was his plan A. That was not going to fail. So God 100% had the capability of quickly raising up leaders to make sure that this thing succeeded. And I think he did. And they weren't perfect leaders. We know that because we have the book of Galatians, which was written to the churches in this area. And, uh, and we see that things did not play out perfectly. But... We do know that if God intended for this thing to work, and he did, uh, that he 100% had the capability to quickly raise up leaders to make sure that it happened. But maybe more significantly than that, don't underestimate the power and the significance of people filled with and completely submitted to the Holy Spirit. I mean, they were young. They were young believers but don't underestimate the power of people that are completely filled with and submitted to the Holy Spirit. And not only that, the text says that they were prayed over, they were fasted over, and they were committed to the Lord. With that in mind, I'd like to, I would just like to appeal to you, please pray for your, for your church leaders. <laughs> Seeing the, the effectiveness of this in this text, that that these people prayed and fasted for their leaders, and it worked. They were committed to the Lord. Uh, would you pray for Pastor Reg? Would you pray for Pastor Steve? Would you fast for Pastor Chuck and Pastor Sean for me? We do so for you, and we do so gladly. It's not, it's not a burden at all. It's a privilege and an honor. But knowing that, uh, that the prayers for leadership help the leadership to be effective. I just yearn, I yearn for your prayers. I long for, you, for your prayers so that the leadership of this church is good. <laughs> would you, would, I appeal to you, I ask you, I yearn for your prayers. Uh, intense Christianity includes multiplication. And intense Christianity, which we've said, it's, it's not a different type of Christianity, that's just the real thing. It's, it includes troubles, Third and last, I think looking at this text, you see intense Christianity includes friendship. And that's not so bad. Intense Christianity includes friendship. And here's why I say that. Verse 26. From there, from Italia, I remember when they were, where they were going to catch the boat. They hop on the boat and they sail to Antioch, the early church headquarters, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Listen, it's a blessing to get to do anything for the Lord. And I'm not even just saying that. I talked earlier about how much I love my job. I love what I get to do. I seriously, I really do. And take the money away, and I still am over the moon that I even get to do this thing. To get to do something for Jesus Christ and to get to do it. Um, I don't, it's just a wonderful blessing to get to do it. But not only is it an amazing thing to get to do something for the Lord, but it's even better when you get to do it with friends. It's like an amazing, I'm, I'm blown away all the time that it's not just that I love what I get to do, but I love the people that I get to do it with. You look at this text, there is a deep camaraderie in the early church in Antioch. You see that um, it, they declared all that, that, that God had done with them. They had this homecoming of sorts, their, their home, and they declared all that God had done with them, which certainly included a lot of celebration, right? Like they had seen a lot of awesome things happen. We saw disciples made. We saw churches planted. We saw leaders raised up. We saw people healed. Like, amazing things. But it also, as we've talked about, included a lot of devastating lows. 
they declared all that God had done with them. So you get this idea that certainly there was relationship enough for them to celebrate and have, have fun and, and celebrate the triumphs, but they also probably mourned and cried the difficulties, the new scars on, on Paul's skin. That level of friendship, I believe, is what the church was designed to be. This depth of friendship, it requires no little time together. That's what the text says, is they spent no little time together with the disciples. That's cool. Uh, if we're going to do this, it's going to require no little amount of time together. And it's going to require honesty. I think to have this depth of friendship, we're going to have to be honest with each other. I, I need to let you not only see the stuff that I want you to see. I mean, that's cool, and that's fine, and you can see that, but I'm also going to have to let you see the stuff that maybe I really don't want you to see. Otherwise, you don't really love me. You only love a false version of me, and vice versa. Um, and I think it's going to include teamwork. I know that it's gonna, we're going to have to stack our hands on being committed to each other. We're going to have to stack our hands on me being committed to you even after uh, I, I see and learn the things about you that you don't want me to know. I'm going to have to stay committed to you even when it costs me something, right? As intense Christianity, I think, includes friendship. This is the stuff that the world looks at and calls it inconvenient. It's, it's inconvenient to live your life in pursuit of something else, of someone else. It's inconvenient to uh, consider the needs of other people as greater than your own. It's inconvenient uh, to be about the things that God has called us about. But listen, Jesus said that he came not to bring us a burden, but to bring us life and life abundant. This stuff isn't burdensome. When you decide to get intense about following Jesus and be about the things that God is about, that's not burdensome, it's just better. Like it's not, it, it may feel like a sacrifice. In a lot of ways, it will require you to sacrifice things, but it's, you're not stepping into bondage. It's, it's a better thing. It's abundant life. It's not inconvenience. Uh, this is how Christ, this is how God designed the church to work. And when we step into that and when we live that way, we discover it's better because he made it to be that way. This is just what we were meant to do. If you look at the church in the book of Acts, now certainly there are a lot of things that are different than the church in 2024, culturally, in our period in human history. That's real. But consider why. Why were they seeing so many salvations? And why were they seeing so many disciples made? And why were they seeing so many churches planted? Honestly, I think that a lot of it has to do with the fact that they were committed to this thing. They were intense about it. They were all in. So here's what's at stake this morning. Here's what's at stake this morning for us to walk away transformed by the word of God. This is what's at stake. People, if we walk away transformed by the word of God and we decide to be intense about following Jesus Christ, people will get saved. People will be freed from sin. Churches will be planted. Missionaries will be raised up. Unreached people groups will not be unreached anymore. We'll have less church hurt. There'll be fewer teenagers who graduate high school and walk away from the church forever. Look, this is important. This is what's at stake. So, here are a few steps for us to maybe, I don't know, be a little more intense. <laughs> Number one. Respond to the gospel. Look, if you've never responded to the gospel, that means repented of your sins, asked Jesus to be your savior, and given your life over to Jesus, make Jesus your Lord. That can happen right now. And I'm, I'm begging you, I'm, make that happen right now. And even those of us who have lived our whole lives in church, like, I, I want you to consider, everyone wants Jesus to be their savior. Like, we want Jesus to save us from our sins. But have you made him your Lord? Have you let him be your master? 
If not, even those of us who have grown up in church, I want you to consider, is this you? Do you need to respond to the gospel today? Number two, and this isn't for everybody, uh, but number two would be seek spiritual counseling. And here's who I'd like to talk to about this. If you feel enslaved to a specific sin in your life right now, and I don't even have to name it, you already have it in your mind, you know what I'm talking about. You feel enslaved to a specific sin in your life that you know is keeping you from living intensely, devotedly, unapologetically for Jesus Christ. Look at me. I need you to tell somebody. You are trying really hard every time. You're like, I'm going to do better. I'm going to strategize harder. I'm going to be a little better next time. I'm not, I'm not going to do it again. And, uh, and that's not going to work. It's never worked. That's what the devil wants you to believe will work. And uh, if you continue to do that without admitting it out loud to anybody, uh, it's not going to work, and I don't even feel bad for you. If this is you and you are enslaved to a specific sin, I need you to tell somebody if you want to be free. Tell a friend. Tell a pastor, tell an elder, just say it out loud. We have an awesome, a really, really good spiritual counseling program here at this church, a team. Uh, we're seeing people get freed, and I'm not even exaggerating. Every single week, we're seeing people get freed from bondage of sin that, that has claimed them their whole lives. This can be available for you, but listen, you need to say it out loud. Number three, plant a seed. Pray, maybe even right now, that the Holy Spirit would direct you to someone to plant a seed today. I don't know what you do on Sundays. Maybe you go straight home and you would need an answer to prayer for you to even have an opportunity to plant a seed. Or maybe this is a good time to mention that you should come at 2 p.m. behind JB Furniture and we'll probably have a lot of interactions with people who don't know Jesus as we clean up uh, behind the, the, the fair parade. But I want God to lead everyone here to do something uncomfortable for him today because by the time that the sun sets tonight, we will have had a chance to actually be obedient. We'll have had a chance to, um, to, to be intense. You know what was really intense? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in the garden before his crucifixion he says my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death those are some heavy words and he's sweating blood like he's 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 in so much agony there is blood coming out of his sweat and he prays this prayer he says, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He's like, father, if, there, if there's any way for the cup of your wrath, for me to not have to drink it, for me to not have to be separated from, from communion with you that I've had for all of existence, if there's any other way. But he knows that there's not. And so he follows that prayer up with, but not as I will, Father, your will be done. Why? For our salvation. That's intense. Jesus went all in for us, for his bride. So we're going to remember his all-in sacrifice by, by taking the bread and the cup we do this, we take the bread and the cup um, to remember the bread, his physical body, his, the physical all-in sacrifice that he made with his body on the cross. And we take the cup as, as a physical remembrance of the, of the physical all-in sacrifice he made with his blood on our behalf. We, uh, we practice, it's, we call it open communion. And what that means is if, if you're a believer uh, but not a member of Community Grace, then you're welcome to partake in, in the bread and the cup with us. We would love that. If you are not a believer, oh man, I just, I just want to invite you right now to, to repent of your sins and make Jesus your Lord. Not so that you can get a snack and some juice, uh, but so that you can partake in this and celebrate 
for all of eternity with, with us as family. So I'm going to go ahead and pray. And, uh, and if you are not a believer, I didn't, I didn't say this, if you're not a believer, we would ask that you just allow the bread and the cup to pass. Um, but let me pray. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your example of intense obedience. Thank you for your example of submission, even to the point of death. And not just death, but separation. Lord, I pray, I ask that as as we take the bread and the cup, that it would cause us to remember how you went all in. And that it would motivate us to respond in the same way. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen.